welcome to Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, where we talk about gospel insights through great stories and help you find entertainment that is both true and beautiful. And welcome to Radical Civility, where I'm in the market for as good a tagline as they have. My name is Ben Piccini. I am very excited to be here with my friends, Carl and Liz. We're doing a crossover episode today. I think it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree and Radical Civility are both part of Public Square Media, a network of podcasts that seek to bring an LDS perspective into the public square. I'm your host today, Carl Cranny. I have a PhD in religion and have written on the intersection of religious themes in pop culture. And joining Ben and I, of course, is my co-host, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Busby. I'm a writer of science fiction and fantasy, a reviewer of books, and of course, a Latter-day Saint. Today, we are doing, as Ben said, a crossover episode. We will be talking about Hated in the Nation, an episode of Netflix's dystopian TV show Black Mirror, which seeks to showcase how future technology could be misused. In this particular episode, things do not end well for people who are mean on social media, and particularly those who use the hashtag Death2. We picked this episode for this crossover edition of our two podcasts because its themes dovetail nicely with everything that Ben tries to do on Radical Civility, having hard conversations while remaining polite and open-minded. But we are first going to do our best books segment where we each recommend one thing that we are watching, reading, or listening to. Liz, why don't you go ahead and start us off? My recommendation today is a fantasy book called Star Mother. It's by Charlie N. Holmberg, who is an LDS author, student of Brandon Sanderson. She's written quite a few books, so she might know her in her own right. I picked this book because I think it has some, even though it's secondary world fantasy, there's no LDS people in it, but it has some interesting LDS theology influences, I think. The concepts of what does it mean to have a mother in heaven to have things people be born in a celestial environment what does pregnancy look like in heaven this gets covered in the first few chapters uh, there's also some interesting world building with odds that have to respect human agency lots of interesting stuff and it's just a fun as to see romance i really enjoyed it and i highly recommend star mother by charlie n Holmberg. thank you the two things that I'm going to recommend are based on a sort of project that I had. When ChatGPT came out and started doing some really interesting stuff and MidJourney upgraded itself and started doing some really interesting ability to create art, I had a friend who had ChatGPT write him a children's book and then he went to MidJourney and had it illustrated and he published it on Amazon and I thought, what a world we are living in. And so I wanted to go back and revisit some old science fiction greats on the issue of the rise of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to recommend iRobot by Isaac Asimov, where they go through sort of the development of robots in what he thought was the future, because it's here for us now, and the interaction between the different rules of robotics that he has about how they can't harm humans, they have to obey humans, they have to preserve themselves. And there's some interesting sort of LSAT problems as these robots have glitches and trying to figure out how to function with these three rules in place. And then I also went and rewatched recently AI Artificial Intelligence, which was originally based on a short story by Brian Aldiss, but then turned into a script by Stanley Kubrick and then a movie after Kubrick died by Steven Spielberg. And it's interesting because you can see everybody's hands in it. And I think the whole thing could have gone through maybe another edit or maybe made into two or three movies or something but it really asks the question if we can get robots who can do all the things that humans do are humans worth having around anymore because by the end of the movie sorry small spoilers the humans just all died off and nobody noticed until at one point the robots look around they're like have you seen a human there have you met a human recently there and they realize that all the humans are gone and it's just such an interesting sort of a little uneven, but also I think asks really good questions about the nature of humanity and the nature of what artificial intelligence might look like. It turns out the guy at the flesh fair was right, which is really <laughs> surprising. So anyway, Robot by Isaac Asimov and AI artificial intelligence directed by Steven Spielberg are both things that gave me lots of things to think about as we look at the future arriving right now. 
And iRobot's just like same sci-fi genre as Dark Mirror that we're going to be talking about, right? Like that, let's tinker with technology and see what could happen to us kind of thing. Like more of a thought experiment, right? He's so great. And everybody needs to read more Asimov. By the way, I have to tell you about, because it's me, one of my favorite memes that I saw this week. It's a party and it's a bunch of robots. And it says 2-22-22-22. It's the date. And they're all celebrating because what a fun date to have that be the date. One robot looks to the other and goes, the humans really would have liked this if they were still around. <laughs> yeah. Dark, but that, appropriate. I liked it. That's, that's, My recommendation that's, this week is a book that I'm excited to read and I have not read yet. I have never taught an educational psychology class and I was asked to teach an ed psych class. And there's a book by, uh, do either of you listen by chance? Intelligence Squared US. So it's John Donvan. He is an ABC journalist, reporter, very well regarded. And he does in-depth reporting. So I'll take a topic and go really in-depth on it and explain it really well. He hosts Intelligence Squared Debates, which is one of my favorite things to listen to. It's smart people arguing on both sides. And most of the time I'm sitting there listening, going, ah, I could totally do better. And I totally could. Like brilliant, right? Really like his stuff. I just found out that he wrote a book. And the book is called In a Different Key. And it's the story of autism. So they start by interviewing the first man who was ever diagnosed, who is still alive at the time of the making of this film. I think he's still alive. So in the first place, that's mind blowing to me. This is a very new thing that we are finding language for. When I was growing up, autistic had a very different meaning than it does today. Or I shouldn't even say autistic. Today, autistic itself is a word that is charged. It is a person with autism, right? Um, the way that the language has evolved, the, the way that we think about it. So there's both a film and a book. One of the things that is in the trailer is how police interact with people who are neurodivergent and what neurodivergent means. And I really want to look at it through the context of school. How do you teach to somebody who is on the autism spectrum disorder? What do we know about where it comes from and what it is defined as? It's won a bunch of awards. It looks like it's really well reputed. I have not read it myself, so I have no opinion to give, but I'm excited and looking forward to doing a deep dive on this. Yeah. I like the Intelligence Squared podcast. It's one of the ones that I listen to in the morning when I swim with my underwater headphones. It's a great way to start the day, listening to super smart people argue. I also can recommend Intelligence Squared US, the podcast. I also listen to some of the UK ones, and the debate ones are great when I'm exercising because they make me angry and my heart rate goes up a little bit. So that's good. <laughs> that's a secret, that an untapped secret to getting your heart rate up is to listen to... <laughs> Things that make you mad. Things that make you mad. But we will have links to all of these recommendations on our website, popcultureapricottree.com. If you are interested in buying any of these, buying through these links helps support our podcast so that we can keep bringing you conversations about the true and beautiful in pop culture. You may have noticed that we had something new in our intro this time. We've joined with some other LDS podcasts and Public Square Magazine to form the Public Square Media family of podcasts. We'll still be doing the same show that you know and love. We're still in complete editorial control here. We're just going to be putting in some plugs for other podcasts in the network that we would love for you to be listening to. So look for that in future episodes. We thought we'd start off with this crossover episode because both Ben, who's been on before, and Radical Civility are both in the Public Square Media family of podcasts as well. And with that, we're now on to our main discussion of the Black Mirror episode, Hated in the Nation. And I think we need to start just by talking about Black Mirror in generally. How much Black Mirror have you all watched other than this one episode? This is my one and only so far, and it was really good. And I'm not sure if I can watch it anymore or if I need to watch all of them. Like, it's one or the other, and I'm not sure where I am. I walked that same line, Ben. I've seen a few. Basically, my husband loves Black Mirror. He'll tell me which ones I can handle and then we'll watch them together. Uh, yeah, I can only watch one at a time. Can't binge watch Black Mirror because you will be depressed about the state of the world and the future. Uh, yep. So I have to ask, where, do you feel like you were able to handle this one? This one was a good one. This one was actually pretty tame. Watch the Archangel one, um, which is about software that you can install in your children's heads to filter out what they see, which was terribly traumatizing as a parent. So I found that one much worse than this one. <laughs> so uh, let me just say that I was watching with someone. It might have been my wife and we were about five minutes in and she was like, I'm good. I'm going to pass. This is pretty intense stuff. And I was like, it's just getting good. <laughs> you know? like, 
it is an intense show and it's definitely very British and very cable in its sensibilities. So there is liberal swearing and liberal sex and violence things going on. Like they're not pulling any punches on those things. This episode in particular is not too much worse than say like CSI in terms of violence and creepiness. But there are definitely some that are too much for me. And this is not one that I would watch with my kids. Like, point blank, no. It's way too scary. What I liked about it, though, is that it's exceptionally thought-provoking, right? It's very clear that they're not doing it. I hate to say it. Gratuitous is all in the eye of the beholder. My feeling in this is that there is a purpose to it. There's some level of teleology. Like, we are doing this because we want you to think. We want you to be a part of this world. We want it to be raw. It does not quite feel the same as HBO, where it's like, we're going to throw a scene in there just because we're HBO and we have to now, right? Like, we have that reputation. It feels gritty, but it feels authentically gritty, if I can put it that way. For sure. But it does have a slant in that Black Mirror really doesn't do happy or optimism or, like, good technology. I was reading an article, and it said that basically Black Mirror is fixated on the concept that no matter how shiny the future gets, all technology will eventually kill us or at least destroy our relationships. Like, it is not happy, but it is a good iRobot type think piece show. Like, what would happen if this? And then it takes it down the worst path possible. Before we started recording, one of us said, it's like the Twilight Zone, but it's always sad and it's always dystopian. And I think that might be the best explanation that I can think of. That hits the nail on the head. That was the one episode I've seen. I was like, yep, I get it. That's exactly right. Yeah, I have watched all of Black Mirror, but I did have to watch it in chunks. And there were a couple that I waited until I knew I was in the right mood and that I could handle it. There is one positive episode in the whole thing, but that's the San Junipero episode. But yeah, all the rest of them are very bleak and dystopian. And even the one that they released where you can like choose your own adventure if you have the technology, there's one happy ending out of all the ones you can choose. And we had a science fiction watch party with some friends of mine from my ward, the ward I used to live in here in the area. And we chose our own adventure as we went through it. And we ended up on the happy one. And I was like, good for us. us. Like, you did it. There are like 10 possible endings. And we just happened to find the one. Oh, wow. That was, yeah. So Black Mirror is very dystopian. But I like your thought, Ben, that it is very thought provoking. And there is some teleology. That's a good way of phrasing it. Like they're doing this deliberately. HBO does that just to be HBO. Black Mirror does it to make you think. And I'm not sure that's always better, right? I think there was an interesting piece in Deseret News recently that said, are true crime shows immoral? And I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's a much more interesting question than we think. I think there's a good case to be made that even if it's true, there are some things that we're just not meant to think about and see. I remember growing up, it was unsolved mysteries and it would creep us out for days and stuff like that. And I, I think there's a tasteful way to do those things, but I also wonder at what point, that's an open, complicated moral question. Let me just put it like that. I don't think that there's, I don't think it's as simplistic as let people watch whatever they want to or just make good choices. I think, I think it actually goes pretty deep. Well, and I think yeah. that's an important point when we're watching Black Mirror <laughs> as well, like, we have to realize that Black Mirror is not representative of all the possible paths technology could take. It is purposefully a mirror of our world, but a black mirror. It is the worst possible scenario. And so if we fixate on like this as the truth, as the projection of the future, it's pretty depressing. So I think it's important to balance it out by also thinking about the positive sides of technology and not just being in the doom and gloom. We should all shut down all our technology and move to the farm. I'm glad you say this because Black Mirror is carrying this message of technology is bad and it's not. One of the biggest things that we know, one of the clearest things that we know is that technology is very good at giving us what we want and what we tend to want is if it leads, it leads, right? There's a huge negativity bias, pessimism bias, if you prefer. That's true. In social media, in traditional media, that's true just across the board. I remember there's a great statistic in an episode of Freakonomics where they cover this during the pandemic. At its very worst, the media negativity was like eight to one more negative than positive. And then when it got to the best part of the pandemic where things were going really well, things shifted. So it was only five and a half times more negative to positive. 
or something like that. Like I believe those numbers. numbers. I absolutely believe those numbers. But you know, of course. I also think that there's something a little bit meta about Black Mirror being like, technology could be dystopian. You are the problem, folks. <laughs> you are literally doing the thing that you are critiquing. And Let's, at some point, this is where we throw in the Taylor Swift clip. It's me. Right, exactly. It's me. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah, and I think that's a real thing that we have not fully grappled with. So, right. The creator did give an interview during the pandemic where they said, so are you going to do a season six or five? I forget how many they did. And he says, no, we're all living through a dystopian nightmare right now. Ain't nobody got time for my nonsense at the moment. And I thought that was really interesting. The point that you made in concert with that Deseret News article are true crime shows moral one of the reasons why one of our taglines here is to help you find entertainment that is both true and beautiful i think this episode of black mirror might be true i certainly don't think it's beautiful necessarily but it is thought provoking so let's talk a little bit more specifically about it and get into the nitty-gritty of it so spoilers ahead for those of you who haven't seen it but in the episode, somebody dies and the person investigating the murder discovers that there were people using a particular hashtag on social media targeting them, the death to hashtag, because the next day somebody else dies and they were the person who everybody was death to on Twitter or whatever. And then they realize that someone has engineered a social media campaign and the person who has the most death to hashtags targeting them that person will die and once the public gets wind of this it becomes this huge discussion until at the end of the episode everybody who's ever used the hashtag ends up getting killed there are these robot bees that, that the uk has that the someone's near the back door into controlling and so this is really interesting question about how we use social media because i think black mirror is on the side of technology can be reused for really bad purposes. But I, for one, am really glad that we have social media most of the time because it allows me to stay in touch with old friends and to see what other people are thinking and get news really quickly. And there are a lot of benefits to it, but this show definitely likes to talk about the ways we misuse it. So I don't know, anybody want to riff on some of the things that I've just brought up there about how we use social media and the consequences thereof, which in this episode are really dire. Most of the time, the consequences on social media, you don't get killed by using a hashtag. Two things. Number one, I wish when we had given the, the content warnings in our little preseason thing that we had given a bug phobia one because I could hardly watch the bees. Like, yeah, uh, too much creepy crawly. Number two, I thought the genius move of the show was that the first person they talked to who used the death to hashtag is this nice preschool teacher who is also a caretaker for a disabled person. And it's like so much sympathy for this character. There's no way you can hate this character. And yet she's also doing this hateful thing online. And so it, it really highlights the cognitive dissonance there, right? That. It's easy for us to think all the terrible people online are terrible people in real life, uh, but not the case. They're all just people. I think that's a really compelling point, Liz. I really like that. By the way, the reason, and I think that this is important too, the reason why the first person gets in trouble on social media, why people start chanting hashtag death to, it's death to Joe. And Joe is the name of this journalist who writes a piece talking about how I'm sick and tired of people claiming victim status for being disabled. And she names a disabled person. So it's this hugely controversial piece. Nobody likes it. At the end of the show, one of the moments that really struck me was after all of this has happened, everyone has died. They're leaving a government panel and you see protesters hatefully knocking on the door of the car and screaming at this person. How could you have let this happen? How could you have done this? And it's to me, it's this like very deep symbolic moment of, Congratulations, you learned nothing. Yay, aren't we so You glad? learned nothing. Right? You like, it's so depressing. Like, yeah, exactly. Congratulations, you lose. You didn't even get the moral of the story. I think that was a really powerful moment. The other, the, the big reveal to me was at first, at the beginning of the show, you think that it's going to be every day another person dies. 
and it's going to be the next person and the next person and the next person. And you're really freaked out by that. And you're like, oh my gosh, every day there's going to be a new person. How are they going to end it? And I'm thinking like in Sherlock mode where it's like, they're going to put somebody out there and he's going to save that one person in the nick of time. And then what is revealed is no, this person has been laying breadcrumbs the entire way along. The whole point is that the person that's dying every day is bait for all of the hateful people on the internet. That bait ends up killing. And I think that in, in the, the, the in-universe show detail, I want to say it's 387,000 people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody who ever uses the hashtag ends up dying in the same terrible way. I see Roman Colosseum, people tearing each other apart kind of stuff. That's what I am getting from the show. So I think that... That to me is very compelling. I do want to ask really quick, have either of you heard the story of Justine Sacco? Yes, I was going to bring up the book, You've Been Publicly Shamed. It's been on my TBR for a long time. Yeah, it's been online for a long time too. That You go ahead and talk about the Justine Sacco thing and then I'll bring the book back in, Ben. Because she's one of the examples in the book. Okay, good. So I believe it's the author of the book has a fantastic TED Talk. It's a TED Talk that I share with students in two of my classes. It's, I have to give some pretty heavy warnings because it's a very raw TED Talk. And the first thing that I say is in the technology class, you need to understand how vicious it can be. And you also need to understand how real it is to the person going through it. So that's what I say in the tech class. In the introductory class to education, what I talk about is professionalism and don't say dumb things. And if you're not sure what's dumb and what's not, then just don't get on Twitter. The court of public opinion is not fair. It is not unbiased. It is not trying to be. And so you just need to know that going in. And it's just a general warning of you have to be really, really, really careful. Justine Sacco is a woman who was working, I want to say, for a PR firm or something like that. And she, she didn't have any followers. She was a, very much a nobody. And then she's hopping on a plane and she makes a joke. And I really don't want to tell the joke, both because it's so easy to misinterpret, which is why it blew up, but also, and maybe it was the right interpretation. Maybe she just said an inappropriate joke. I don't know. But the author of this book comes back and says, I want to give her perspective. I want you to know what it feels like to have been her. And you see the hate pouring in from online. And people will say, we're doing this to hold the powerful accountable, except that Justine Sacco is not actually all that powerful. And then they will say, and by the way, I'm sure she's fine, except that she's not fine. She's not fine in any meaningful sense. It has broken her and it's broken a lot of other people who have had this happen. There are people doxing her. So she gets on a plane for this trip, she tells a joke that she thinks is funny. She doesn't think about it very much. It does not land well. Somebody who works at Gawker, who I have a deep moral vehemence against, right? I have a very hard time with the idea of Gawker. I believe that it's somebody who works at Gawker, retweets her to, to his 15,000 followers, and they jump on it like rabid dogs, and they tear her to shreds. She's on a plane. She cannot see any of that. They find out that she's on a plane, and a little posse gets together at the airport. She turns on her phone at the plane and she's got, it's, her phone is blowing up and she doesn't know what's going on. She walks out and there's a group of people booing her and chanting against her. What I'm trying to show people is it's very easy to hide in the crowd. This is mob mentality taken to its worst possible extreme. It's extremely dangerous thinking. And I think it's a friend of mine on Twitter who I really like and I get along with. He recently said, he was like, I don't know, you, you don't like Twitter because you say it's not a good place for discussion. I just don't see that. I think it's a great place for discussion. What are you talking about? And I was like, because we don't mob people in real life anymore. That's the difference, right? We don't take people out of context, grab their sentence that's the worst sentence they said, and then show it up to all of our followers to be like, see, here's the awful person that I am dealing with right now. These are not just normal features of Twitter. These are encouraged features of Twitter. This is how the algorithm works. Right. And so it's a very, anyway, I could go on even longer. Why don't you talk about the book? So I was just pulling up the Wikipedia page on the book and it says explicitly that the, that book was an inspiration for this episode. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. It's all the circle of life. And I think we see a little bit of that in the episode, especially with the third and final victim of the hashtag before the mass death event that happens to everybody who used the hashtag when they're trying to protect Clara Meads, who is just this woman who took a photo and put it on Instagram, doing something inappropriate to a, a statue war of I think it is. some yeah. war memorial, right? Like just something dumb and silly. But you see her in her apartment looking at her phone as her Twitter feed blows up as everybody's like, oh, you are a terrible person, Clara Meads. 
I hope you die. And they start swearing at her and all these things. And the death to hashtag is taking off. And you see her, just this random person who just posted a dumb photo that was inappropriate that she shouldn't have done. But the actress, I think, plays that really well. What is it like to be mobbed in this online mentality or to be mobbed in this online way? Because it has real effects on real people. You don't have to show up at the airport. And I I like that it sort of played that up. So you see the first one is this journalist. The second one is this rapper who did something dumb. And the third person is this woman who was inappropriate at a war memorial. But watching her is a great part of the episode to see that sort of reaction because I know there's the conversation that the two cops have with that woman who lives, who you brought up, who is like the preschool teacher and she takes care of a disabled person. And she's like, well, yeah, I use that hashtag, but it's just online. It's not real life. And I hate to break it to everybody, but being online is part of real life. And that's part of the problem that I think this episode showcases is that we treat it as if it weren't. And the mastermind behind the whole diabolical scheme says, what if Twitter were real life and it doesn't end well for anybody? So I'm going to say something that sounds very stereotyped and I'm, I don't think it is stereotyped. And I think I have some evidence to back that up, but I want to recognize that I'm treading on sensitive ground. So I, the first thing that I would say is I think that these impacts happen very differently for men and women. We know that it is the case for young women of around age 13. So if you introduce girls to social media at very young ages, the suicidality rate about triples for young women who have early access. For men, we don't see any noticeable change in suicidality. I think that there are also negative effects. They just don't come out that cleanly in the data. I think that they're hidden underneath. I also think, and I have heard this said before, I am no evolutionary biologist, and I know just enough to make me think that I can justify anything by appealing to evolution. And that's really dangerous. But I think that one of the ones that I've heard that seems to make sense is if you are a man and you are shamed by your peers, as long as you can hunt and be strong and do man things, you can be okay 6,000 years ago. If you're a woman and you're shamed from your village, it means basically death. That's the very cheap, very oversimplified version. Like I said, I'm not totally sure that's right, but it seems sensible enough. When women are shamed, it, it is a very different impact than when men are. And I think that there is some truth in that. I think that there is actually a difference that goes beyond just stereotypes. And one of the things you find out is that the villain in this story, the one who programs the bees and does all of this stuff, is upset because a friend of his is affected by being publicly shamed and it's a woman. And so he wants vengeance. I think that there is a gendered nature to this that's worth exploring. If I knew more about gender and if I were more informed, then I would be happy to do it. I think the most that I can say is that's an interesting piece. The second interesting piece to me is, a friend of mine asked me the other day, he said, you always talk about how we need to get out of the culture wars, but aren't the culture wars important? And I actually really liked the three examples of the things people did that earned them a ton of hate because none of them were actually all that meaningful in the long run. And let me give you the three examples. So the first one is a journalist who says, look, this person is just a Mars. They were disabled and they like went up to right in front of Downing Street and set themselves on fire because of some law that the government had passed that would adversely infest disabled people. Yeah. It was a protest suicide. So in protest, the person lights themselves on fire. There's a lot of mourning. And this person goes, look, I just don't have any patience for this. They did this. This is on them. Very, a very, how do I say this? Something that should probably be inside the Overton window, but also something that normal people are going to go, ooh, that's not a great take. I don't like that take. The second one was a rapper has a young fan who loves this rapper. And instead of being like, hey, you keep it up. You're going to make it like me. The rapper goes, oh, no, you're awful. Like, you you have no idea what you're doing. And then the third one is this woman who at a patriotic site takes a picture of herself and it looks like she's peeing on the grave. She's not. She's just being silly. I think that of the three of them, only one, only one is genuinely significant at all. And it's the first one. And it's probably the kind of thing that is, is the kind of speech where I would say, I don't like it, but it's the kind of speech that should be protected. The other two are just utterly frivolous. They do not matter in any significant way. And yet everybody gets exercised about them in these deep and profound ways. Like, how dare they? This is so infuriating. No, it isn't. And if you think that's the most infuriating thing going on in the world, it is because of your limited perspective, because you have not checked the news on Ukraine lately, because you have not been to a country that has a despot ruling it, because you, you don't know what it means when we talk about developing countries 
and what that phrase is code for. What we're talking about is extreme poverty, the likes of which most of us have never seen. So I think that was something that they captured in a really powerful way is like, it's not just that people are dying over truly outrageous things. It's that they're dying over manufactured outrage, over outrage that nobody actually thinks is all that important anyway. Say that's the entire point of the trending page on Twitter is that it combines the negativity bias that you talked about earlier with kind of a fear of missing out and mob mentality all combined into this toxic stew of nonsense. If you go look at the trending page on Twitter, a good chunk of the time, most of the top things on there are not positive or are something frivolous like that. But it just affects our psyche so much. I can play the evolutionary biologist sort of thing too, right? Like that little icon goes off and I'm like, oh, I got to click on that because I want, because I, I get a endorphin rush from clicking on notifications and it just puts all of this together in such a weird toxic stew that is no good for anybody. I want to hear what you wanted to say, Liz. I just, I have to shout this out because I just looked at mine right now and I know that they're all different. But it's arrested, R.I.P. Randy, go woke, go broke, truth social, Mormonism, directed evolution, the Great Salt Lake is shrinking, and you'll forgive me for this, but it's one of the, I don't even know what this refers to, Rapey McForehead. I, like this, and like, I, I have just so filtered at this point that I don't even pay attention to it because I know it's all garbage. But this is the outrage factory. That's exactly what this is. I was kind of same note of outrage factory and news that's not going to be news and isn't relevant. Have you read the book Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman? Oh, this is an interesting one. And I read it a long time ago, so I'm going to get his arguments wrong. And he wrote it in 1985. So this is a long time ago. So he, w he was decrying like television and print media, but I think all of his arguments apply times 10 to social media. But basically his argument is that this culture of news as entertainment has made us feel like we need to have an opinion about everything. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. We all know about like these random school board decisions in states where we don't live, where we cannot vote, where our children don't go to school. And we feel like we have to have an opinion and post something about that on Twitter. Or this rapper makes a rude comment to a kid. And so everybody across the entire nation, even people who don't watch the show, who don't listen to the rapper and don't know the kid, have to make a comment on it, right? It's this manufactured thing where we have to care about things that actually, in reality, have no effect on your life. Reading this book really helped me rethink, what do I actually have to have an opinion on? What can actually affect in the world? And what can I not? And those things that I cannot affect, how much is it relevant for me to keep up on that? Like, obviously, war in Ukraine is tragic. It's going to be an important event in world history. I try to keep up on it to the amount that I can have an effect on it, which is I can help send money. I can participate in service projects. But the amount that I need to know about the details is small because I am not participating in foreign affairs in any meaningful way. And it sounds callous, but it's his argument is that we were probably happier when we were more ignorant about these things. So I've said before, and I think that this is still true, I just don't think that we are wired for the tragedies of an entire world. And what I mean by that is thinking about it in terms of, again, evolution and this trap that I fall into, and so it's, it might be totally bogus, but I think that throughout history, we knew maybe 400 people, maybe 1,000, and in most of them in a little village. And now all of a sudden, like, you might see two great tragedies in your lifetime. A child dies early or the old woman is struck by lightning or whatever it is, you might get two of those and those are really bad and everybody mourns together and it brings you together as a community and then you move on. Now we are subject to that kind of thing. And by the way, we're a country of 300 plus million people. Every day there's somebody doing something horrifically stupid. I'm not even talking about horrifically evil. I'm just talking about so inanely dumb that you could spend your entire life going, I can't believe that I have to live in a country with these people. Guys, we're a big country. There are school boards right now that are banning books that are really stupid. I can spend my life getting upset about that. I don't see any evidence that it's, that is a very different statement from most of the school boards in this country are moving in a direction of banning books that is really dangerous, which I don't find support for. Even if it is the case that it is a generalized problem, we still react to the individual anecdote. We still have the emotional response to the terrible tragedy. And to your point, Liz, there was recently a tragedy, and I sometimes say this, 
I will pay my respects to the tragedy. I will spend five minutes and I'll pray about it. I'll say, all right, I need to know how to pay my respects for something this horrible. I also need to play with my kids and get my job done and do other things in my life. What is the appropriate way for me to honor the sadness of this horrible thing that I probably shouldn't know about, that I cannot control, that I cannot do anything about? What can I do in, I have 10 minutes. Sometimes I will just sit and sit with my feelings. Sometimes I will pray about it. Sometimes I'll write to a representative. Sometimes I'll say something about it on Twitter that is hopefully uplifting and also gives a little bit of a clearer picture of how people are thinking through the problem. And then I move on. And I think there is very much this tendency to, to say, I'm a good person because I am hurt more by this than you are. And I just don't believe that. I don't think it's good to wallow sometimes. The pendulum has swung too far. You are not a good person for being more upset about a tragedy than other people if there's nothing that you can do to fix it, right? You're signaling that you have feelings. Good. I'm glad that you do. You need to be able to process this and then move forward from it productively. It's like global news brought us the world's tragedies, but now social media has brought us all of the tiny idiocies that, that we didn't have capacity before, and now we do. And we're not built for it as humans. I find it interesting also, you talked about the mastermind behind this scheme is inspired by his coworker who tries to commit suicide and he finds her and saves her after she's essentially gone through a similar doxing experience online because she was trying to report someone who had sexually harassed her on the tube, and then it turned out that person had some intellectual disabilities, and so she got doxxed back. And so it's interesting. I find that a complex knot to deal with morally, right? Like, should we say she shouldn't have reported sexual abuse or sexual harassment? No, we shouldn't say that. But should she have put it on social media to shame this person? Is, was that the right way to deal with it? Like, how do you deal with your problems when, in a time when the default way to deal with any minor annoyance is to post about it on social media? If you're a good person, at least you anonymize the details. But like a lot of people don't like they're willing to say, hey, this person at this place was a jerk to me in the Yelp review. Name the person who was having a bad day at work. And like now that is forever on the Internet for their boss to read. And every other person who wants to go to their restaurant, you know? It's funny because I sometimes get in fights with my friends about social credit systems and they hate social credit systems. They think they're so dangerous. And they think that what I'm saying is social credit systems are good. I'm not. I'm saying social credit systems are here. And they got here a while ago. And if you think that they're not, then you're not paying attention. Like, well, Isn't there I, another I terrifying Black Mirror episode about social credits? Yes, it's called Nosedive. And it is literally about a world where you get ahead in life if you have a particular status on social media. And it's about a woman who stars Bryce Dallas Howard. It, she takes a nosedive because she does a bunch of things on social media that make her scores drop. And it's terrifying. And now she can only work at Starbucks because no one else will hire her or whatever with her score. Yeah, yeah. There's an entire episode about from the Orville where they find mm -hmm. a world where people basically use the Reddit upvote system to determine who gets punished by crimes. Like it's like a jury by social media sort of system. And the Orville has to figure out how to, oh, post a picture of this, of the off, the fake picture of the officer's dog from the Orville who's been captured doing something stupid. And a couple of different TV shows have tried to address this phenomenon in our society where we, because we have access to so much news, decide to have an opinion on everything and then literally, in a couple of these cases, act as judge, jury, and executioner, or at least in the case of the nosedive episode, the human resources and who can hire you and things like that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now I've just thought that the solution to this from a gospel perspective is you are special by Max Lucado. And now we're going in a direction I don't want to go. But how do you stop the social media stickers from sticking to you? So here's the question. This is how I want to sort of wrap up our discussion here. At one point, Ben, we'll have to link this in the show notes. You did a great thread on Twitter about how to be a good person on Twitter. And it was really interesting. And Liz, you had uh, an entire series at one point about helping your children get on social media and doing it in a responsible way. We've talked about all the negative aspects of social media. Let's wrap up by talking about what are the solutions? The <laughs> yeah, what are the solutions to the problem? Because it's not just all go back and live on the farm and throw our phones in the garbage disposal. 
as fun as it would be to watch my iPhone in the Will It Blend commercials, <laughs> which were old classics back in uh, the day. How do we fix social media? Go. How do we fix social media? Okay. We've got right. Elon Musk on speed dial where we're ready to solve this problem in the next 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> I'm going to give my one one-liner the ad that I saw once on Twitter, actually, and it said, dance like nobody is watching, but email as if it will one day be read out loud in a deposition. <laughs> and yeah, I think that right. is true. It's one of the things that is so terrifying about social media, and Elder Bednar points this out in his 2014 talk for Education Week at BYU about how the internet like never forgets. And I know there are some apps like Snapchat stuff that are supposed supposedly. to help you supposedly is supposed to help you forget but that is something that i'm very wary of that's why you should dance like nobody's watching but email and tweet and facebook and instagram as if it will one day be put out put on the jumbotron for everybody to see and that might be a good way to at least look to yourself to say am i using social media responsibly am i tweeting like it will someday be read out loud in a deposition or put up on the jumbotron at the last judgment I want to push back, though, because I think that what you just said is very good advice for 13-year-olds, and it's actually terrible advice for 30-plus. Okay? And the reason why I shouldn't say that, it's also good advice for 30-plus, but when everybody does it, it causes a unique problem. I'm totally being Professor Ben here because it's a math problem, right? When students make a mistake in class, you have two options. You can correct it, and then they feel bad, or you can say, awesome mistake. Let's figure out how he got there and what he can do next. As it turns out, how you respond to mistakes is very important. A pro-error classroom, right? We call this a culture of error. And the whole point of it is it, errors are going to happen. You're going to make 6 million mistakes before you learn a new language. You might as well get 15 of them out of the way today, right? We learn through mistakes. We learn through feedback. We learn through trying to do the best that we can. Part of the reason why I'm on Twitter, and this is very much my philosophy, is I do not think too hard before I send my tweets. But I try really hard to think about my position before I say out loud what I am thinking. I don't do a lot of let me hide what I think. I do a lot of is my position actually a good one? And I think everybody needs to get better at this. When we say that the internet never forgets, I think we're saying two things, both of which are true. First, there's always digital evidence. The whole rise of screenshotting culture, right? I can have that image or that thing you said or whatever it is, and now I've got evidence and I can hold it against you. But it's not just the digital tool. It's that we think in those terms when we're on Twitter. We are less gracious. We don't extend grace to people. Mm -hmm. We are out for blood and we are looking for We're that. collecting evidence. That's right. So my friend Dan Ellsworth, he named it for me once and I've never been able to forget this. Accusation is the epistemology of hell, right? How does the devil think? What is his mind frame? It's always in the pointing finger. Knowledge is only useful insofar as you can use it against someone. That is the epistemology of hell. And you probably know people like this. I know people like this, right? Where their gut instinct is to say, how can I use what I just learned to hurt somebody else? And I think Twitter makes us more like that. We take things out of context. My favorite examples are just plain old nut picking. You take a thread of 10 things that somebody wrote and you respond to the weakest link in the chain to beat up on the person. Nobody ever takes the, the strongest point. Nobody attacks the best possible version of the other person because the goal isn't about the other person. It's about the crowds that are watching. So I hope Elon Musk is listening to this because I put a good deal of thought into this. I think the problems are more fundamental than just we need to be good online. We need to be ethical and responsible. I think it's in the wiring of these systems. And I think even deeper than that, it's with our infatuation with democracy. And let me explain what I mean. Great book that I recommend to students. It's called Against Democracy. I love the way he thinks because he's just iconoclastic on everything that he does. He's smashing the statues. And there's apple pie, the American flag, and democracy, and they all have their own pedestal. I think he really does not like democracy as an institution. But I walked away going, I still think democracy has some good, but I'm a whole lot more willing to talk about its downsides than I ever was before. And I think that's a really valuable exercise for anybody to go through, no matter what the topic is. If you love something, you should love it enough to interrogate. So, why do I say democracy? Because if you had votes for president on Twitter, it wouldn't look that different, except a little bit less verification than our current votes that we have for president. It's just a popularity contest, right? Democracy is literally the enabling of as many voices as possible and allowing everybody to have a voice. And I think what we are starting to learn is the reason why we had journalists, the reason why we had publishers, 
was because they were gatekeepers that kept out a lot of terrible voices. They kept out the racists, that kept out the low resolution angry thinkers that said, hey, that person who's complaining on nextdoor.com is probably not the person we want to publish in the letters to the editor because they just have the habit of complaining about everything all the time. And that some amount of gatekeeping is a really good idea. I, I was a school teacher, right? That's my whole background. And there's one rule that you learn if you're ever a substitute teacher. You can start strict and then go lax, but you cannot start lax and then go strict. And Twitter and Facebook and all of these places, they said it really lax. We're freedom of speech. Say whatever you want to. And they have slowly ratcheted up, realizing that they were enabling hate speech, that they were creating these terrible environments. No one has grappled with the fact they started lax and they tried to go strict. And now people are laughing at them rightly because they had no, no idea what they were doing. If you want to fix the problem, you have to figure out how can we enable the best voices to have a louder reach? How can we squelch the worst voices or get rid of them altogether? What is our system going to be? And right now, it's still very young teacher in the classroom stage where you're trying to punish all the bad kids and all the good kids are like, this is stupid. I might as well enjoy the entertainment. I'm going to be a bad too. The first thing you have to do is recognize the good actors and say, we need more people like that. Good job. you. Let's have a top 10 Twitter board where the top 10 people of the week are shouted at. It feels like it's something you would laugh at because it's so countercultural. Because you would never do that on Twitter. You would never, you would not follow somebody for being a nice person. You'd roll your eyes and be like, go to LinkedIn. We all know, go to the right place. Uh -huh. you know, I, I somebody really... needs to do a like match each of the social networks with one of the seven deadly sins. Oh, that meme, that meme exists. <laughs> oh yeah, Tinder is lost. Absolutely. Like it's there. We'll yeah. find that, put that in the show notes too. I have to say this next piece. Today I asked my students, I said, how many of you think that mutual is real? Like it's presenting a real depiction of the other human being. And they all laughed out loud. And they were like, no, oh my gosh, it's so fake. It's so bad. It's the worst. I said, great. How many of you are using it right now? How many of you have it on your phone? And all of a sudden I see all of these timid little hands start to go up. Yeah, I'm guilty. I'm the problem. The problem is me. I am the problem. This is social media. It, social media is the thing that we all feel guilty about together. It's like seeing a friend at McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to admit it's, oh, do you also sometimes go here? Yeah, it's very, I'm only here for my kids. Yeah, it's difficult to know how to solve these problems. Uh, as Carl alluded to, my, one of my freelance writing gigs is for a group called Defend Young Minds that works to defend kids from pornography exposure and other bad stuff online. There's no magic bullet. Like, easily the best thing for kids is to wait as long as you possibly can, give their brain chance to develop some um, impulse control and get some experience in the real world. But the other thing is just to have conversations about it with people in real life, like not on social media. Like one of the main things, every article I write for them always ends with, hey, talk to your kids about this problem. Like don't wait for them to discover it and get in trouble. I do think, and I, I want to hit this note strong, I do think that more normal people speaking up in normal ways is a big benefit because I think part of what has happened is because we're scared of being mobbed or attacked or whatever else, there's clear evidence that there's a self-censoring effect where people in the middle are being quiet. This is part of why I'm radical civility right now, because I think a lot of normal people have very normal opinions, but they're afraid to say them because they know that somebody is going to attack them on one or the other sides. And so now it's captured by the extreme. And I think normal people speaking up really does start to sort some of that problem. I, long term, I'm an optimist on this. I teach a class that's all about this stuff. And it's really fun and it's really useful. And one of the things that a lot of my students are starting to say is, actually, my parents had really good rules around this stuff. We had to get off screens an hour before bedtime. We weren't allowed to have phones in our room at night. We didn't get a phone until we were 16. We had social media, but our parents had access to everything that was going on. Missionaries now have social media and multiple missionaries have come to me and said, we have been told that we're doing this so we can reach out to people that we wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. But the reality is, aside from the aspect of pastoral care and ministering and looking for others, the reality is there are rules around social media usage. So when we come home, we already know how to use it in ways that are productive. Setting time limits, getting on deliberately because you have a specific intent and not because you're wasting time or scrolling. I think these are really valuable things. And I think long term, a lot of parents are picking up on this. The question is whether we will be able to adapt fast enough. Now, I do have one other point that I have to make on this. My long-term fear is that we will continue to get better at hacking the brain faster than we can adapt to the ways that we get better. And my example of this is 
when I ask my students, what is a dangerous show to, to show to kids? They'll talk about Game of Thrones. Don't let kids watch Game of Thrones or scary stuff or whatever else. What parent is letting their kids watch Game of Thrones? You would be so surprised. The shows my kids' friends talk to them about in, yeah. The show that I show them, though, it's one of my favorite studies. Sometimes Google this. Google study SpongeBob SquarePants. The study and what it finds is that it's not the content. It's the fact that SpongeBob SquarePants changes scenes and has over-the-top reactions to everything. The scene change average, if I'm remembering the study right, was like three and a half seconds. The scene has changed for us, the three of us, not one time in the last hour and a half. But on SpongeBob, it's boom. I show my students a four minute clip of SpongeBob SquarePants, and then I show them the clip of the opening to the old Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And it is jarring. It is so jarring, right? So sometime if you want to experiment on yourself, pick any five minutes of SpongeBob, then watch Mr. Rogers neighborhood. It's not, the content is a problem, right? The data and privacy stuff, you should get TikTok, TikTok of your phone. If it's on your phone, it has your data. Get it off your phone. Don't watch TikTok. But even if we found a better TikTok with a better e EULA, EULA, right? If you could do all of that, just the fact that it is a seven second and then you flick to the next video and you sit down, you're going to watch one and three hours have passed. That is a problem that we have not yet figured out how to solve. Because it doesn't matter if it's all innocent cat videos, you still wasted three hours and your brain is now being wired to want more and more. Working on our attention spans, making our kids read long books, watch a whole movie. Like even movies are hard. <laughs> now, a good show to watch on this whole hacking your brain thing is on Netflix. It's called The Social Dilemma. And I think it may be a little overwrought in some of its conclusions, but there's some interesting stuff going on there. And I'm with you, Ben. Like, even on YouTube now, they have the YouTube shorts, and I find myself clicking on those shorts more and more, and it's just not healthy, and it's a concern as well. But we need to, to wrap up and move on to our final I segment. I have one more where... suggestion along with that. Okay, okay, sure, go ahead. Digital Minimalism, the book by Cal Newport, is fantastic. Same problem. It's a little bit overwrought about the dangers of social media. I made my teenager read it when he had an incident of overusing his phone. I said, okay, we're going to read this. And some <laughs> of that is, you know, for the top, he's like, the app store wants your soul. It's the stuff he talks about how to hack your brain to use social media in a deliberate, purposeful way when it serves the purpose the best. And not just because everyone else is on there. Like those things. And then he has a whole chapter about how you need solitude. It is so hard for me, but I try to go on walks at least once a week without an audiobook, and it kills me because I could be listening to more <laughs> things. But it's so good, and we never have time anymore where we disconnect like that. I'm going to throw in my last couple of things really fast. There's a BYU series, BYU TV produces it called Family Rules, and there were a couple of episodes on how to build technology contracts with your kids so that they have input into the system. And the whole episode is, here's how to think through it. Here's things that we've tried. Here's things that haven't worked. Here's things that have. One of the things that is increasingly a common thing among parents is you just don't get anything till you're 16. It's just too young before that. They're not ready and they may not be ready even at 16, but that's a common one that I'm hearing a lot more about is that implied age. By the way, I agree on, so on the social dilemma that's required reading in my class, right? You have to watch The Social Dilemma and we watch it together. We have popcorn and my students will look at their phones like it's something evil for a couple of weeks. And I, I agree. I think there are some parts that are overwrought. But at the same time, I also think that, what do I say this? When you look at the people who have been accused of clutching their pearls, you actually go back and at least the things that I've studied, whether it's violent video games or drugs or whatever else, typically, if you look at it honestly, it may have been that some of these things are overstated in their harms, but the people who are claiming there was never any harm all along are also overstating their case. That as it turns out, violent video games do not show any evidence that they're all that good for you. Solving the marijuana problem by putting people in prison is probably a really bad solution, but also marijuana is not some wonder drug that makes everybody happy. There are real and scary problems that come with this stuff. And so I, I view it the same way with social media where it's like, we need to figure this out faster than we're going to be capable of. It's going to take us 200 years to get the really good research. It's okay to be just a little bit overly careful with this stuff until we do figure it. Yeah. 
in 200 years, there'll just be robots in the year 222 <laughs> or February 22nd, 2222, right? That's it. Right? Yeah. And here's a plug for camping. I remember, Ben, when you and, and I and Susan and Laura all went camping together, and that was just so fun. I'm reminded of a quote by... Robert Muir, influential in the creation of all our national parks. The human spirit needs places where nature has not been rearranged by the hand of man. So that's another reason why I go camping. Because when I go camping, once we get there, because I use GPS to get there, my phone is off and I'm just there with the campfire and my kids and nature and it's lovely. And I will just say, kids need boredom, right? So not a book, not just a non-digital activity. Don't feel like you need to plan something for them. We stumbled into this because when I was growing up, we would watch TV on Sundays. It just wasn't a big deal. But we were a little bit young and married, and we just decided we'll figure it out later. But for now, we just don't want the kids watching TV on Sunday. Maybe we can come up with a better rule later. And I'm actually really happy. My son complains every time. He's like, I don't like Sundays because we don't get screen time. He made a stop motion Lego video of a flying guy just on my wife's phone. Kids get creative when they have to find something to do. And I really genuinely believe, I don't think that you should do it all the time. You shouldn't do it as a punishment. But there is something really healthy about, hey, pick up a stick, poke a tree. Let's go camping and just walk around and touch dirt, like touch grass, do something. Frankly, the same thing applies to us adults. I listened to a podcast uh, for breakfast by Laura Vanderkam, and she, she's a big promoter of effortful fun before effortless fun. Oh, I dig it. Like, how many of us have hobbies anymore that require getting out a bunch of stuff and doing work? Like the amount of time we spend on those things has gone down exponentially. Knitting, watercolor, woodwork, all that stuff. And if you can get yourself started on that, it's actually so much more fulfilling than screen time. But it's so hard when the screen is right there and effortless. So we should do the same thing for ourselves. All right. For our closing segment, we go through and give the TV show or movie three ratings. One is for content, clean versus objectionable material, celestial, terrestrial, celestial, outer darkness, artistic merit is one to five popcorn balls, and gospel connections is one to five apricots. So let's start with the content one. But how would you rate the content of this episode of Black Mirror? Hated in the nation. Liz, you go first. Oh, man. There's a good deal of swearing and definitely blood. We literally watch people die. And that was one thing we didn't talk about. But I liked the commentary on this hardened police detective who's seen tons of dead bodies. And she is completely shook up by watching someone actually die. And so is her rookie. So I don't know that I can put it in Celestial. There are definitely some people the show is not for. I would put it in terrestrial, though, because I don't think it's bad enough that I'd feel like I have to fast forward and explain to people. And just a more adult level of show, though. I think I would mirror that. I think I don't want to make the comparison. I think there's the teleology of it all. It's almost a Schindler's List. Yes, it's really hard, but there's a reason for it. It was very hard for my wife to watch. And there were honestly, there were parts where it was gross. It made me uncomfortable with the it's violence is the wrong word gore whatever you want to call it right the creepy bees were really creepy and i know that this is one of the more innocuous of the episodes i would be very cautious to recommend this to anybody at the same time i'm glad that i watched it i think that i got something out of it i was prepared going in um i, I does it reflect badly on me as a latter-day saint because i watched a show with that much cursing i don't know i hope not i'm like i said i'm not necessarily recommending it but at the same time i'm glad I it. I learned a lot from it, and I think, I think it raised some really interesting questions, but I would also be very careful in the way that, you know, watching other episodes, and even this one, if, this is, if you're one that's easily triggered by stuff, I wouldn't touch this one with a 10. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to introduce it in our sort of precursor episode to season two of Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, because we wanted to give people a warning and say, be careful of this one, we're going to talk about it. But just be aware that it's got some issues. I think I would actually put it in the telestial camp. Because even though there is purposefulness to the objectionable things, I'd still as a whole find them objectionable enough that I would be... I would also be wary of recommending this to someone if they didn't have a VidAngel subscription. 
But to getting to your point, Ben, on artistic merit, one to five popcorn balls, I'll start out with this one. I think it's five popcorn balls, evidenced by the fact that we've been talking about this one episode now and all of its attendant themes for an hour and 20 minutes. Like, it really hit on a lot of different points that help us generate what I think has been a really good conversation. And that shows a level of thoughtfulness and artistry in the writing and the themes and the selection of how they craft the story and the way they put the different incidents together. I give it five popcorn balls because I think it's just a really solid piece of television, despite the fact that I gave it Telestial as far as its content is concerned. Well, I don't have much to add. That was a very good explanation. Yeah, I think I might give it four. I felt like it dragged a little bit in places. This is a 90-minute episode, so it's a short movie, really. I think it could have maybe been tightened up to be 60 minutes, but it is really well done. It's a great speculative sci-fi about what if, and it's a great episode. It was good. It was interesting. It was fun, but I agree. You could have tightened it up. At the same time, it's an episodic show, and they're basically little movies. You need to be able to move on quickly. I thought it was very, very compelling, and I think acting was great. The script was pretty good. It was pretty tight. I'd still probably give it a five, but I, a five that's tweakable, maybe a four and a half. To me, the length of it is a benefit because it's that slow build up until the final moment of consummation of this guy's dastardly plan where he murders 380,000 people because they used a hashtag on social media using electronic bees. It's they got to put all those pieces in place and then slowly build the tension up so that when all the bees on the screen go red because she gives it away just before that moment. What if he's going to kill everybody who used the hashtag? And then the, the guy from the government says, nope, we're going to do this, hits the button, and then it turns red, and that just sense of... The panic, the dread. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's definitely effective at the emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And our final rating is Gospel Connections. We usually call this morally edifying messages. I don't know if that's the right term for what their thesis was in this case. Morally depressing messages. The morally depressing messages, but certainly thought-provoking ones. So one to five apricots. I don't know. Liz, you take it away. You made the rating system. So what are you going to uh, do with this episode? I've made my bed. Now I have to lie in it. Uh, it's definitely like very thought provoking. I mean, could have kept going on for a long time. You, you could teach a whole thing on this. I uh, wouldn't necessarily say it's gospel connected for sure. It's a cautionary tale. It's an old fashioned fairy tale where the bad people get what's coming to them. And the bad people is all of us. So... I would put it in the middle, like three apricots. Like it's... it's there's no redeeming people in this one. There are not. Like the And the satisfying conclusion is that we know she's going to get revenge against this guy. And that's it. Like the most positive thing to come out of this is he's going to get his come up. And, but that's it. 378,000 people might have died, but it's actually 378,001. One. Because more violence will solve this problem. But I think to your point, I guess this is the place where it really shines. It's a really interesting moral dilemma. It's a lot grittier than Star Trek The Next Generation, but it feels like the same kind of like, what question we want them to ask as they leave? It's a moral puzzle box. Right. And so I think the moral drama piece is one of my favorites. I think they did a really nice job with that. And I left going, wow, I wish that everybody had to grapple with. I think one of the, <clears throat> one of the easier ways to make something symbolic that is meaningful is to say, let's take this thing that people do innocently, but is wrong and attach really heavy consequences to it and see how that changes behavior. And literally, it's called a game of consequences. That's right. And so it was like, it was very on the nose. And all of a sudden, you see that maybe we're not the good people that we think we are when we're jumping on people online. Justine Sacco, that whole story. So I think the moral drama is the best part. Yeah. And we'll put links to all the books that we've talked about and recommended on these things in our show notes for those of you who are interested in maybe reading some of the things that we've been talking about. I think I'm going to also land on three just because of the weird ambiguity of this particular episode because it's not gospel connections. The messages aren't necessarily morally edifying, but they do have a moral component to them and it is deeply thought-provoking. And so I think I'm going to end on three with the recognition that 
our system has its own flaws and maybe this episode isn't necessarily built and designed to be really rated by this particular system we've come up with. It, it has its virtues, but I think we've shown maybe some of the limitations of our system here as well. Ben, where can people find you on social media if they'd like to? I am on Twitter being insufferable. I jokingly say that I'm the voice of conscience that nobody wanted or asked for on, or at least that's what I try to be absolutely insufferable as possible on Twitter. I also podcast as, as hopefully all of you know now, and I occasionally write in various places, including for Public Square. Liz, where can people find you? You can follow my writing and book reviews, find my social media on lizbusby.com. And I am on Twitter at Carl Cranny. Thanks, everybody, for joining us this week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a like or review on the podcast platform of your choice. Smash the bell icon and the subscribe button on YouTube, whatever floats your boat. Subscribe and follow us on social media, despite the fact that we've spent so much time disparaging it in this episode. So you can enjoy future episodes. Ben, anything you want to plug for Radical Civility before we wrap up? Uh, my five listeners, thank you for being loyal, even while I'm getting my dissertation done. There will be more content eventually, I promise. And Liz, what are we going to be talking about in our next episode of Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree? Okay, well, as we said in our intro to season two, next time we'll be discussing The Chosen, everyone's favorite streaming show that stars Jesus. The final episodes of season three will be in theaters uh, February 2nd and 3rd, and then available to stream the next week. And we'll be recording right after that. So it should be timely on this one. We're going to have some good things to say about how to adapt the scriptures, uh, media, and why The Chosen is working when so many others have not. So be ready for that discussion in our next episode. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree. And Radical Civility. Encouraging you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. See you next time.